And so is YouTube. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining in with us on our Wednesday night midweek service. We're going to go ahead and start with a word of prayer and sing some hymns and get into the message for tonight. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just uh, blessing us and providing for us. Thank you for uh, just being with us, Lord, even with uh, things uh, just set aside and our schedules just changed and people at home that would normally be working and uh, a lot of just normalcies, Lord, that have been put aside. Thank you that you're still with us. Thank you that you guide us, you, you protect us, Lord, that uh, you provide for our needs. And uh, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We ask that you meet with us tonight. Pray that you bless our time that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing a couple hymns here. The first hymn we're going to sing is I Will Praise Him, page number 10 in your majesty hymnal. If you have one, I will praise him. If not, we're going to put the words up on the screen. You can sing along. And uh, I will praise him. When I saw the cleansing fountain Open wide for all my sin I obeyed the Spirit's wooing When he said, wilt thou be clean? him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain, give him glory all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain, though the way seems straight and narrow, all I claim was swept away, my ambitions, plans, and wishes, at my feet in him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain, give him glory all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. Blessed be the name of Jesus, I'm so glad he took me in, he's forgiven my transgressions, he has cleansed my heart from I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. Glory, glory to the Father, glory, glory to the Son, glory, glory to the Spirit. To the three in one. I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. All right, we'll sing our next hymn I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, page 635. In your Gloria hymn, uh, I'm sorry, not your Gloria, uh, we use the Gloria uh, hymnals in the Dominican, uh, in the Majesty hymnal, 635, and the words will be up on the screen if you want to follow along with that as well. Page 635, I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. 
couple of announcements slash prayer requests, kind of throw them all in there at the same time. Um, remember, we have our Sunday school hour at 10 o'clock. I want to encourage you all to be with us. And uh, look, you have no excuse not tuning in, you victory people who want to sleep in on Sunday mornings. Get up, tune in at 10 o'clock. We have Sunday school hour. You don't even have to get out of your PJs. You can stay in your PJs, and uh, you couldn't do that getting away with church. I guess there's some churches that allow you to come to church in PJs. and uh, Well, anyways, that's another subject. But uh, no reason to miss Sunday school, 10 o'clock. Please be with us. Uh, we're going to continue on our study in the book of Romans. Pick that back up uh, this Sunday, and I hope you'll be with us all at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning in main service at 11, also 6 o'clock Sunday evening, and I hope you'll join us. Also, the Spanish, uh, some folks that asked me about the Spanish, uh, the Spanish is arch archived. We were pre-recording the, the services and trying to have them post at a certain hour on Sunday. Uh, we were trying to have them uh, post at 4 o'clock. And uh, just had so many complications with that. So we just archived them. They're available on the YouTube and the Facebook uh, live stream page there. You can tap into those if you're interested. Uh, if you have Spanish friends uh, that like some Spanish preaching, uh, we have a number of friends at Woodlawn that uh, look at that as well. And so those will be available for you on those pages there. And I want to encourage you uh, along those lines. Uh, I want to encourage you along the lines of giving. Be faithful in your giving. And uh, remember the Lord in all of this. Uh, a couple of prayer requests for you. If you can keep a couple of folks in prayer, uh, we got notice. Um, I don't know if many folks at Victory know this family, but the Leto family, uh, brother Carlo Leto, pastor Carlo Leto, pastors uh, Salisbury Baptist Temple out in Salisbury, Maryland on the Eastern Shore. Uh, the Latos have just been good friends of ours for many, many years. Uh, he and his wife and daughter tested positive for the COVID-19. They are, uh, they're not doing horribly they're not hospitalized i think they're they're dealing with that at home but high fevers and just all the things that go along with it and uh certainly i know they would appreciate your prayers and uh they just boy they've gone through it they seem to catch every bug that blows their way um they went they took a, a mission trip down to the dominican um uh, last year it was last year or the year before the latos they went down in it 2000 it was last summer they went and uh, they actually went down to Nagua to uh, where we started our church. They visited with Jeff and Pam Polanco. And, uh, and then somewhere along the line, they took a trip to the capital. And then they went to another town, uh, even poorer town, and spent some time there. And I believe it was in that town they all picked up dengue. And they all came back with dengue fever. And so they're, they've just been through it. And so if you would keep them in prayer, the Leto family, uh, Pastor Leto and his wife and daughter, and uh, I know they would appreciate your prayers. Also, if you would keep in your prayers, our landlord, Miss Sandy, she needs to have surgery next next week. Um, I think they're putting a stint in for some things, and I think that's next Thursday. If you just keep her in your prayers, and uh, she's just battling a lot of health issues, battling cancer, and a number of things. And uh, I know she would cover your prayers as well. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get into our message for this evening. Our Father, we do love you. And uh, thank you for your goodness to us, God. I pray, Lord, that you would be with uh, these prayer requests. I know there's several others, Lord. And uh, I do pray that you'd be with the Latos tonight. I know there's uh, many, many other people around the country that are battling this sickness. And I uh, pray that you'd be with each and every one of them. I uh, pray, Lord, we carry the Latos to you tonight, especially just because they're dear friends of ours. I pray that you would heal them and strengthen their bodies and see them through this and help them. Uh, recover fully, and I uh, pray you be with their church, their dear folks there in Salisbury, and just faithfully serving you and through the years and the investment that they've made in our family and our children with their summer camps and various things that they've done. Thank you for them. I pray that you bless them in a special way. Pray for Miss Sandy, Lord, that you be with her and her upcoming surgery next week, that you would just strengthen her body and help her. I pray that uh, that everything would go well and that there would be no complications. I know uh, these days it's difficult with different procedures that have nothing to do with the sickness going around and they get complicated just because of the chaos and the craziness. Uh, Lord, I just pray that everything goes well and that you would see her through that. And uh, also, Lord, that you would heal her of her cancer and all that she's been battling through the years. Pray that you'd strengthen her body and help her uh, with that and Dave as well. And that just be with both of them. And we thank you for them, their generosity, and how they have just worked with us, allowed us to be in this house, and helped our family out. 
and uh, we thank you for them. God, I pray for just folks at Victory and uh, just everyone there. I haven't talked to many folks lately, but I'm sure that everyone's feeling just the financial strain of everything going on. I know the number of folks are out of work and uh, just at home and having to uh, just kind of get through this. And God, I just pray that you would show yourself strong on behalf of your people and that you would help us all be faithful to you and just keep our eyes on you as we are continuing forward. Lord, you're not limited to our circumstances. You're certainly not limited uh, to this uh, illness. You're not limited to what's going on. And uh, Lord, you are strong and you're mighty and you have proven yourself to our family time and time again uh, to that very fact. And we thank you for that and your faithfulness. I ask that you just help your folks and be with people, Lord, and help everyone, different situations. Be with Pastor uh, Skinner tonight. The whole Skinner family, thank you for them. I pray that you continue to strengthen Pastor and his body and uh, get him back home as soon as possible. I pray that you'd help him to recover and get strength in his legs and uh, be able to get back on his feet soon. And Lord, all the things that he needs, I pray that you'd be with him. Touch his body tonight. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you meet with us. Help us with our study back in, in the book of Ephesians. I pray that you'd speak to hearts. Help us to see some very important things tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to go back to the book of Ephesians. If you want to open back up, Ephesians chapter 4. Pick back up where we left off from last week. And uh, we're going to touch on, um, I don't want to say a sharp issue. It's not sharp, but it is very direct. And uh, Paul is uh, going to transition into, well, let me just back up. Uh, I said before, when we first started this, this study, uh, I made several introductory comments just to, is, along the lines of how the book lays out. And, um, of course, how it's split between doctrinal and practical, but also that um, what Paul is going to talk about is based on where we are. And I said that the theme of Ephesians is our riches in Christ and who we are in Jesus Christ, what we have in Jesus Christ. And that our behavior flows out of that truth. It flows out of the fact that we are in Christ. It flows out of what we have in Jesus Christ. And that there are responsibilities that come with being a child of God and being in Christ. And it's not enough that we just have these wonderful things that we've talked about. But there are some responsibilities that come along with that. And this is going to get very pointed uh, with what Paul has to say here. He's moving on from dealing with our spiritual growth, which we dealt with last week, to focusing in on a more dramatic change in behavior. And um, the flow of this section really mirrors that of Romans chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. And we're not going to turn there for time's sake for tonight, but we'll get to that on Sunday morning for Sunday school, so join us for our Roman study. And uh, But Romans, th that section there from chapters 5 through 8 deals with kind of this idea we're going to talk about tonight, but more fleshed out. Chapter 5 is the blood atonement and our salvation, uh, obviously, because the salvation is it comes through the blood of Christ. Chapter 6 is uh, an argument against a life of sin. Now that we're saved, you know, we need to cut out the sin. But chapter 7 and 8, chapter 7 is the old nature or the old man, and chapter 8 is the new nature or the new man. And that really is what Paul focuses in on in this section. So let's pick up here in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 17, and we're going to read to the end of the chapter here. It's a large section. We're not, we're not going to cover all the details of it tonight, but we're going to go over kind of the basic gist of what he's talking about. Paul says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord... That ye henceforth not that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, that's like we talked about here in Romans 7, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, 
Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now there's a lot in that section. I realize there's a mouthful there and we're not going to deal with all of it tonight, but kind of give the basics of what Paul is talking about here. Uh, there's, a, there's a great illustration of this in the Bible, kind of a picture of, of the idea that Paul is trying to make here with the story of Lazarus. And if you can think about it, over in John chapter 11, not turning there for time, but you know the story of Lazarus, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Lazarus gets sick, he eventually dies, Jesus is in another town, he hears about it, waits till Lazarus dies, shows up, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And if you remember, they roll the stone away and Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, right? He comes out. And he's bound in grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him, let him go. Okay? Why? Because death, he's been raised from the dead. Death no longer controls him. So therefore, he doesn't need to be wearing grave clothes anymore. I mean, this is a simple idea. But it, it's a picture of what Paul is talking about here. You're raised to new life at salvation. And the idea of putting off the old man, putting on the new man, really is this whole, this whole concept. Taking off grave clothes, the old rags that you wore as a dead person, and putting on the new man, Jesus Christ, and his behavior, his mind, his ways. That's what we're called to do as Christians. And that really is what Paul is getting at here. Uh, I can remember when I used to wrestle in high school, um, ever so often a guy would, a after practice, you know, you wrestled at our high school. The wrestling room was probably the foulest, raunchiest smelling place in the whole high school. I mean, there weren't a whole lot of other places that smelled as bad as the wrestling room. Uh, because there's no windows. And you walk in, it's like a dungeon with lights on. It's got a bathroom and a shower. Uh, but, you know, in wrestling, you're constantly trying to lose weight because you're trying to get down and get your weight class and all that. And so the coach would purposefully close the doors, crank the heat on as high as it could go. So it was sweltering hot in there and we're running around killing ourselves and just, you know, just exercising, and working out and just dying and just drenched in sweat. Some guys would put on layers of sweat clothes and rubber suits to make themselves sweat even more. I mean, it's... Not a pleasant smell, to say the least. And uh, occasionally after practice, someone would go and they would take a shower. You think, man, everyone should take a shower. I, yeah, but I, I just I felt weird about taking a shower at my high school. I just I waited till I got home. Uh, but occasionally someone would go and they would take a shower, and, uh, and you know they'd go and then they would leave. And ever so often, I remember one guy one time a guy took a shower, and when he came back out, he forgot to bring a new change of clothes with him. He had, he had practiced in the same clothes he came to school in. He didn't bring his exercise clothes, and so he had his nasty, he had his, his street clothes on to wrestle in, got them all nasty, then he went to take a shower, and the only thing he had to put back on were them nasty exercise clothes. Sweaty, stinky, funky clothes. Okay. And as soon as he came out of the shower with them, them old nasty clothes on, all of us are looking at him like, Dude, why did you even bother taking a shower? You know, you're going to go and clean up just to put the old nasty clothes back on. It's pretty foul. You know, it's pretty nasty. But really, that's kind of the same idea with a Christian 
someone who comes to Christ for salvation, they ask God to forgive them for their sins, and then they go right back to the old lifestyle. It's like a guy exercising, getting all sweaty and all dirty, taking a shower, and then going right back and putting his old nasty, sweaty, smelly clothes back on. It doesn't fit. It's disgusting. And that really is the point that Paul is making here in this section. He's saying, listen, and this is, this is really the title of my message, and the idea I want to get across to you tonight is this. Live like you are, not like you were. Take off those grave clothes. Take off that old man. Put that aside. You got saved for a purpose. I love Romans 6.21. He said, everyone knows Romans 6.23. What's Romans 6.23, uh, Steve? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Okay, you know that. Everyone knows 6.23. But 6.21 is good too. Because 6.21 says, For what fruit had ye in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. In other words, what fruit, what good, what benefit, what product did your sin ever bring you in life? What good did living in sin ever do you? didn't do anything. It only produced death and hardships and problems. So even in there, he's Paul's making the argument, why would you want to go back to that? The whole reason you got saved in the first place is that Christ would forgive your sins and you would get out of that. So for, for a child of God to want to go back to his old lifestyle makes no sense whatsoever. It's backwards. Why did you get saved? You got saved. You said, well, so I wouldn't go to hell. Okay, well, what was, what was sending you to hell? Sin. So why are you going to go back to sin? So Paul here is, 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 is making this, uh, this case, and he's really being very pointed in this section here. He's already laid down the, the foundation of who we are in Christ and our riches that we have in Jesus Christ in the first half. He's talking about unity in the church. He's talking about growing spiritually. And now he's revving this thing up, and he's saying, now listen, here's what it comes down to. We need to be living differently now that we are a child of God. We are children of God. We are saved. We are bought by the blood of Christ. We are a new creature in Jesus Christ. And so because of who we are, we need to live like who we are, not like who we were. And that's really uh, the focus here when we talk about it. Now, there's three things I want to talk about tonight because we don't have time to deal with everything tonight. We'll get into more of the details of uh, the latter part of this section next week. But uh, three things we want to talk about tonight. Paul makes an admonition and uh, uh, um, an admonition for, for his point here. He makes an argument, and then he gives us an application. Uh, the first thing is this admonition. Verse 17, he says, the, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Now, whenever you read therefore, or wherefore, or for, this is a word of conclusion. It is a word of basis. In other words, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. It is based on what I just gave you. It's based on the previous statements. It's based on the previous information that I laid down. It's kind of like Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What's therefore, therefore? It is the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And so that whole doctrinal case of, of salvation and what it's all about, now he says, okay, now you need to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So Paul here, he says, I, this I say, therefore, because of all we talked about, because of who we are in Jesus Christ, because of the riches we have in Christ, because of who we are, because of the spiritual gifts we have, because of the unity we have, because of the growth that we experience as Christians, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, that means from now to the rest of your life, from here on out, from here on out, from henceforth, Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. This is his admonition. This is he's preaching here at these Ephesians. He's saying, stop living like the lost. The Gentiles, other Gentiles there, it's not specific to uh, Jew or Gentile. It's a spiritual re uh, reference. It's kind of like uh, using light and darkness to illustrate uh, good and evil or truth and error. Um, so, Jew and Gentile in a spiritual sense is the idea of believer versus unbeliever. It doesn't mean when you get saved, become a spiritual Jew. That's an argument for another time, and a message for another time. We'll, we've dealt with that before. We'll talk about it another time. But here, he's just talking about Gentiles are the ones that were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were the outsiders. And even earlier in the book of Ephesians, he talked about it in that way. So he says, listen, don't live like those people out there. I know you say you can't say those people. That's a racist statement. He's not. This has nothing to do with race. This has to do with spiritual condition. 
Uh, he's talking about people who are unbelievers, the unsaved, people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. It has nothing to do with race, has nothing to do with uh, ethnicity or nationality or language or you know, financial status. It has nothing to do with anything. The only thing it has to do with, do you know Christ as your Savior or do you not? And he says, listen, you need to stop walking. And the walk here in Ephesians is just a word that talks, that describes the way we live our lives, the way we conduct ourselves. And he says, stop walking, stop living like the other Gentiles, like unbelievers in the world and how they walk or how they live in the vanity of their mind. This is the preaching that he's going to, this is the admonition. Take off those grave clothes and stop living that way. Now, all through the Bible, God uh, admonishes his people to live like they are, not like they were. Usually the admonitions um, are, are phrased in a way like, don't live like the unbeliever in some way, shape, or form. For example, over in Exodus 11, uh, we were on Sunday night getting a little bit further in our study and our series on um, uh, the wilderness journey and our journey of faith. And we started getting into the, uh, the 10 plagues of Egypt. And uh, there was a verse that we read that says uh, basically in Exodus eleven seven, and one of the, the, the plagues that God brings down, he didn't allow it on the Jews. He only allowed it on the Egyptians. And the reason behind it, he says this, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. You say, well, that's racist. And that's not racist. God was proving a point. He said, I look at my people different than I do the rest of the world. He said, I don't like that. Well, you can take it up with God when you see him. I didn't make it. I didn't make the rules. He did. He said, I look at my people differently than I do the, everyone else. And, and if that offends you, you do the same. If you have kids, you look at your kids different than you look at the neighbor's kids. It's just human nature. I don't treat the neighbor's kids the same as I treat my own children. I'm responsible for my kids. I'm not responsible for the neighbor's kids. Uh, I know Hillary Clinton thought it takes a whole community to raise a child or a whole tribe to raise a child. That nonsense she used to put out in the 90s. No, it takes a mom and a dad. That's what it takes. Um, if we do things God's way, we'll accomplish a lot. If we do things the world's way, we're going to have a train wrecks everywhere. But I, I care for my children differently than I care for other people's kids. Now, I care for other people's kids to a certain degree, but I'm not their dad. I am my kid's dad. And... I deal with my children differently than I deal with other people's children. God deals with his children differently than he deals with the rest of the world. He deals with believers differently than he deals with lost people. And so because of that, there is a difference between lost people and saved people. Oh, you can read over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is right after uh, the great passage in chapter 4 where it talks about the rapture and uh, how the, 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 the trump will sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That in Latin, caught up is where we get the word uh, uh, rapture. Uh, that's a Latin word, a derivative from being caught up. Uh, we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. And uh, there, uh, right after that, he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And in chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, you see a striking contrast between us as believers and them. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. You can look at the pronouns there and how he talks about how that we are not in the darkness. We are not of the darkness, but of the light. And they are of the darkness, not of the light. He says, let us walk in the light. And he talks about, goes back and forth between us and them and us and them. And it's very clear that God puts a very clear division between saved people and lost people. And here Paul says, stop walking or stop living like the Gentiles or the lost people live because we're not lost. Those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior are not lost. We know the truth and we know the Lord. So why would we want to continue to live like we used to be? Live like you are, not like you were. So that's the admonition. Then he moves on to an argument. This is kind of the basis for this. And uh, there's some pretty interesting statements he makes here. Verses 18 through 21. He says there, uh, let me take this out because I have too much on my desk here. And this desk is not much of a desk. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. All right. In uh, 
chapter, in, in verses uh, 18 through 21, we see the argument or the reasons behind why we need to be living differently. And uh, he says they're having the understanding darkened, being alienated uh, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, Paul gets into why we need to live differently, and it's mainly based on how we view things. It's mostly perspective. Um, it's mostly based on how we view life and truth versus how a lost person views life and truth. The Christian, the saved person, looks at life differently than a lost person looks at life. The saved person looks at truth differently than how a lost person looks at truth. Um, look at, the, look at the, the, the description that Paul makes here, uh, how the lost are spiritually dead. He says that they're alienated from the life of God. Uh, back in chapter 2 and uh, verse 1, he says, And ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. This is how we were prior to salvation. We were dead, spiritually dead, not physically dead, but spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. This is how we were before Christ found us and saved us. We were dead in those, in those things. And a lost person is that way. Not only are they spiritually dead, they're spiritually blind. It says the ignorance that is in them. He also talks about uh, the blindness of of their heart, the, the fact that they cannot see or comprehend spiritual truths. A lost person just doesn't understand. I can sit there and try to talk to my coworkers all day long about spiritual blessings, and they're just like, whatever. It doesn't resonate with them. Now, the gospel will pierce through. The gospel is what changes hearts and changes lives. The simple death, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how a person could be saved by trusting Christ as their Savior, that message right there will pierce through the darkness of their hearts and the blindness of their hearts. And the Holy Spirit of God can do a work in them and draw them to Christ so that they can trust Him as Savior and they can be saved. But everything else, all the other spiritual truths, will, will be absolute nonsense to them. They won't understand. They won't click with them. I can talk about how uh, God answers prayer. And they might see it as kind of a pragmatic thing of, okay, that's great that you benefited from something. And so, but okay, that's, that's wonderful. You're God blessed. And okay, there's like almost like a, uh, um, not supernatural, like a, um, um, superstitious. superstitious. Yeah. Thank you. Superstitious connection to spiritual things. But that doesn't mean they comprehend spiritual meaning in spiritual truths because they're dead. They're spiritually dead and they're spiritually blind. They can't understand. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are a foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. And so these things, this is the condition of the lost person. Uh, this, this ignorance that is in them in this blindness, this ignorance has nothing to do with education or an intellect. We're not talking about an educational ignorance. Because you can have very um, well-educated lost people. And they can understand a lot of information and a lot of uh, deep, um, hard to understand concepts, if I can put it that way. That does that. That's that's one level of thinking, but that's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about they are intellectually dead or intellectually blind. They are spiritually dead and spiritually blind, and that's another thing. That's completely different. Somebody can be well-educated and completely blind, and they think they're smart. In fact, over in Romans chapter 1, we're dealing in Romans, it says that they, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Uh, this would be the person who is rejecting the truth of God and is creating a different truth in their mind and snuggling up to that false God that they've created in their minds. And they think because they have uh, maybe an intellectual reasoning behind everything and in their minds, they think they've proven God a liar. They think they're smart and they think they're wise. God says they become fools. 
And so all of their higher learning does them no good in that regards. I'm not saying it does no regards in you know worldly things and in uh, providing for financial benefit and all that. But as far as spiritual truth, they're blind. They can't see it. They don't understand it. <clears throat> um, salvation begins really with repentance. Not to lay heavy in repentance, but salvation begins with repentance. It begins with a change of mind towards sin, a change of mind towards yourself, and a change of mind towards the Savior. It's you seeing sin differently than how you saw it before. You understand sin for the first time, and there is a turn in your mind. You change your opinion about what sin is in your mind. You change your mind about how you see yourself and you change your mind on how you see the Savior. You see those three things differently, and there is a turning in your mind and your heart from that to the truth. That's repentance. We're not talking about earning your way to heaven. I'm not talking about that. Real repentance will produce works, don't get me wrong, but real repentance in the sense of salvation begins with a change of mind of how you view those three things, and you change, you turn, you see things differently in your mind and your heart, and you turn from sin, you turn from yourself, you turn to the Savior. That's what salvation is. Now, it's the gospel that brings about that change. It's the gospel and the, the, the truth of the gospel that helps you see the truth of sin, helps you see the truth of yourself, helps you see the truth of, of the Savior, but that turning in one's heart and mind is repentance, and it's changing of a direction. And so the point being... If I have turned to a different direction in my mind, in my heart, and eventually in my life at salvation, I'm going in a different direction than a lost person. I think differently than a lost person does. Because prior to salvation, how does a, how does a lost person view sin? They see it as a game. They see it as an adventure. They see it as something to run to, to chase after. A saved person that's thinking clearly doesn't see sin that way anymore. Oh, they're still tempted. They're still drawn to it. But it doesn't have the same, it doesn't resonate the same as it once did. It's there, it trips us up and it's tempting. But now I recognize it for what it is. I see it for what it is. It's poison, it's toxic, it's deadly, it's evil. It offends God, it wrecks lives. It's completely different. I don't see it like I used to see it. You know, one of the hard things of being around a, a whole bunch of lost people at work is them, you know, chattering back and forth and laughing and, and jabbing each other about, you know, their adventures in sin over the weekend and all the nonsense they got involved in. And it's just like, I'm sitting over here in the corner like, yeah, that's not me. I'm sorry. And I, got, I pull myself away from that because I don't have fellowship in that anymore. That's not me. I don't enjoy those things like I did before I was saved. They do. They're having a good old time. They're having a big time about it. As a safe person, that doesn't resonate with me. I don't see sin like I used to see sin. It's completely different. It talks about the vain thoughts. Paul talks about vain vanity of their mind. That doesn't mean empty-headed. Now, it's kind of a funny way to translate that. <laughs> I could see some of these modern translations coming out with a train. That would actually be pre kind of pretty good. I like to use that. Uh, vanity, because vanity means empty, and mind could be head. And so I could easily see somebody trying to say, well, it means empty-headedness. Uh, but that's not really what it means. Uh, vanity of their minds, it just means that the pursuit of what they long for in their minds and in their thoughts, it's frivolous. It doesn't amount to anything. It may, it may amount to something uh, material, or tangible in this in this life, but ultimately from an eternal perspective, everything in this life is going to burn up and be done with. And so it's still vain and empty if all it does is produce something in this life, but nothing for the next. It's, it's still vain. It's empty. Um, our thoughts are different. Our values are different. But also he talks about how not only um, how the, the spiritual thing, but he talks about, for the Christian, how we have learned Christ. And this is an interesting thing here. He says there, um, verse 20, he says, But ye have not so learned Christ. So he switches from how the lost are and the conditions that they're in and how they live their lives, past feeling and lasciviousness and working on cleanness with greediness. He says, But now ye, talking to the saved people, the Christians of Ephesus, saved people, ye have not so learned Christ. Now, he doesn't say learned about Christ. He said learned Christ. 
You can learn about somebody and never learn that person. You know, I got books on, um, I was, we were clearing out a room over here in our, in our house and set up a desk and some of my, some books, I don't have a lot in my library, obviously most of my library is in a dumpster in the Dominican, but uh, we got a handful of books there and uh, came across a couple books from Winston Churchill. I love reading about Winston, Winston Churchill, a great man during World War II. And uh, I can read all kinds of books about Winston Churchill. And I can learn about Winston Churchill, but I can never learn Winston Churchill because Winston Churchill's dead. It's kind of hard to learn someone who's dead. Okay, Christ is alive. Christ lives. We just celebrated Easter. We just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He lives. Okay? A Christian learns Christ. When a person gets saved, they learn him. There is a personal connection. This speaks of personal salvation. In a personal relationship, lots of people learn about Christ. I learned about Christ when I was a kid without knowing Christ. When I got saved, I learned him. Okay, there's a personal connection there. And Paul points to that in this argument here. He says there, you guys, you saved people, you Christians, aren't like these lost people. This is the condition of the lost people in verses 17 through 19. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. And when you connected with him, um, this, this learning uh, is more than just information. This is a personal experience. You have a personal relationship with God. The lost don't. So stop living like you were them. Because you're not them. You don't live like them. The lost don't have a personal relationship with God. You do. If you know Christ is your Savior, you're the one that has a personal. You know who, you know who thinks spiritual thoughts? Christians do. You know who, who read their Bibles to, to seek truth? Christians do. You know who prays and seeks the face of God? Christians do. Saved people do. Why? Because saved people are the ones who have a relationship with Almighty God. The lost don't have that. There's a difference. We're not like them. Now, it doesn't mean we're better than them. We're not better than them... Um, intrinsically, in other words, there's no more value in us than them. They're sinners, we're sinners. The only difference between them and me is Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's the only difference. It's the only difference. It's the only thing that gives my life value is Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. Without Christ, I'm just like the drunk on the street. There's no difference. I am no better than the lost person, but I am better than the sin of the lost person. And that's what a, a, a saved person has to get in their minds. No, we're not better than the lost, but we are better than their sin. We are better than their lifestyle. We're better than the nonsense that they get involved in. And so we need to drop this nonsense of, well, you know, let's all just kind of hold hands and get together. Let me tell you something. When Christians get that attitude, they, get, they open themselves up and they become vulnerable and susceptible to all kinds of garbage that comes into their lives that bring all kinds of problems along with them. No, we're not better than them, but we are better than that. We're better than their junk. And Christians need to take off the grave clothes and start living like they are and not like they were. Now, I know this is preachy for a Wednesday, but I'm telling you, this is what Paul's laying into. He's saying, listen, you've got to stop this stuff of trying to go back to who you used to be. You will never be who you used to be, ever. That old man is gone. Now, the remnants of the old man are still there. The old nature is still there. The fallen nature is still in you, but you have a new nature, and that new nature is a completely different person. It's Jesus Christ who lives in you, and that's who he wants us to live after. And so there's an argument, but lastly, there's an application here. Paul doesn't stop uh, and merely explain this truth. He tells us how to implement this change of behavior from verses 22 to 32. We'll look at this, and uh, we're not going to get into the details of it, but I do want to touch on the basics of it. We'll get into the details next week. He says, verse 22, that you put off... Concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful. Now, now think about this. To put off something or to take off something, is that automatic or do you have to do it on purpose? You have to do it on purpose, right? Your clothes don't just automatically come off. <laughs> that would be something. You just push a button, boop, kind of like the Jetsons. That's something like from the Jetsons. You 
kids don't remember the Jetsons. Mm -hmm. George Jetson, man, he had a button for everything. He just pushed a button. He'd, he'd fly in on his his thing. He'd push a button and turn into a suitcase or his briefcase. He'd walk into work. He'd come back out, push a button, he'd open up his car, and he'd fly away. It's great. It'd be great if you just push a button on your clothes, bloop, and all your clothes would shrink. You'd go in the bathroom, take a shower, whatever, come out, hit a button, bloop, and come back off. You know, anyways, I don't know why I got off. But to, take, to put off, you'd have to do it on purpose. This is an automatic. So I have to choose to do this. I have to choose to do this. He said that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And now he gives us some specifics. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Again, you have to do this on purpose. Be put away. Purpose to put these things aside from yourself, from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, this change, this is an interesting thing. I want you to think about this. And I was thinking about this when I was kind of going through my notes. This change is really threefold. I used to think it's twofold. Stop doing bad, start doing good. That's true. But there's an, another element that I kind of popped out to me as I was studying. It's obvious that he says to stop doing wrong, to cease one behavior, and to start doing another behavior. You stop doing evil, you start doing good. But there's a third element to this that really extends out, and that's this. Um you'll notice that the new positive behavior is in proportion to the degree of the negative behavior you did before. Think about it this way. He says here, for example, let him that stole steal no more. Think about what, what it is to steal something. You're taking something from someone else, right? So it's to the, de the detriment of another. So he says, okay, step one, you stop stealing, which is a good thing. But then you start working, you get a job, and you work with your own hands. But it's not just that you provide for yourself, which is a good thing. You need to pay your bills, you need to take care of yourself. A lot of Christians stop there, and they think, okay, I fulfilled that. But that's not all he says. He doesn't say just stop stealing, start working so that you can pay your bills and be a good citizen. He takes it a step further. He says, working with his hands the thing which is good, verse 28, why? That he may have to give to him that needeth. This is an extension even beyond just taking care of yourself, which a lot of Christians are good at. We're good at taking care of number one. But God doesn't want us to just focus on me. He wants us to think about the next guy. So it's not only stop hurting people, which is a good thing, start doing positive things, which is an even better thing. But the best thing is that I get to a place where I can help other people. So not only am I not hurting others, I'm actually helping other people, which is the practical blessing of Christianity in the world, is that I would use my life for the betterment of other people and use what I have, not just for me. It's not just that I work for me and myself and amass, and amass this big uh, mountain of wealth, which I don't have a big mountain of wealth. That's kind of laughable even to think about. But I don't just work for me. I Everything I have is to be a blessing to other people. Look what he says in verse uh, 29. This is another one. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So stop talking about nonsense and garbage that hurts people, because that's what talking about nonsense and garbage does, even if you don't think so. It hurts other people. Uh, James has a lot to say about this. He talks about how the tongue is an unruly evil. It sets on the world of fire. And I mean, it's, it's, it's all, these, all these animals and things are tamed by man except for the tongue. Man can't control his own tongue. Uh, just 
Tremendous what the tongue can do. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. What does edifying mean? It means to build up. It means to build up. To be an encouragement that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And so it's not just that I stop cussing and stop talking about nonsense, things I shouldn't be talking about. And it's not just that I talk about, you know, neutral things, politics and sports, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But how about I start talking about things that are a blessing and encouragement to other people and help them because people are going through some hard times. And I can use my tongue to be a blessing to other people and encourage them in their own plight and in their own hardships. Folks, Christianity is not a zero-sum game. Christianity is not about just coming back to neutral and coming back to, to squaring up. It's about, practically speaking, as I live my life for Christ, it is about making a positive impact in this world for Jesus Christ. Being a blessing and a help to other people. Not just ceasing to do evil so that I come back to zero, but actually adding some good to this world. That's so needed. It's so needed. If more Christians would get involved in actually reaching out to be a blessing to other people, we would really make an impact for Christ in our communities. We're so content with saying, well, you know, I'm no longer a drunk anymore. I'm no longer robbing banks. I'm no longer killing people. I'm no longer doing the things I used to do, which is good. I'm thankful. Please don't do those things anymore. But how about we start doing some positives and start adding to this world? To show people that Jesus Christ is alive in us. Um, you know, people are, are so much more willing to listen to your testimony and your words of a witness. If you, they can see Christ in you, to see that Jesus Christ has made a change in your life. Not just that you have a sermon to preach at them and that you, you can yell at them and tell them all the things that they're doing wrong. They hear that all the time. They need to see a change in you that makes you stand out from other people. Not that you're any better as far as you think you're better than other people, but the fact that you're willing to sacrifice and be a blessing and a help to other people in their need. That's what the world needs. It's not just stop stealing and start working, but start giving. Start giving to others. This is a dynamic change, but it is what God has designed for us to live in this life. This is how God has designed us to be as Christians. The miserable Christian is the one trying to be what he was, not what he is. As long as the Christian is trying to go back to his old man, his old life, he is going to be absolutely miserable because you can never be that old person. God has changed you. And he wants to change you for the better. And he wants to keep changing you. Now, he's changed you eternally when you got saved. But he wants to keep forming you and shaping you in the image of Christ. And he wants to keep using you to impact this world for Christ. And if you will continue to take these steps, walking away from your old man and stepping into the new, God wants to use you to do some pretty awesome things. Stop living like you were and start living like you are. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we love you. I want to thank you for your word. I thank you for this awesome, awesome truth, Lord. There's so much here, and uh, as we get into it more next week, God, I pray that you help us all, help me, Lord, to think about this, to, to recognize the fact that I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. I'm never going to be what I once was, and uh, that doesn't mean that I am perfect. doesn't mean that I am what I should be, but I am not going to be what I once was, and I thank you for that. And God, I pray that you'd help all of us as your children to recognize this change and help us, Lord, to stop trying to go back to that old man, to take off the grave clothes and start walking in newness of life. God, help us and pray that you'd use us, even in the limited uh, contact we have with others, with all the social distancing and things and the limited interaction we have with folks. Lord, when we do have opportunity, help us to be a blessing to people. Maybe our neighbors that are in need, people we see. God, help us to do our part and to live in a positive direction, not just ceasing to do evil, but learning to do good and to learn to not only do good for ourselves, but to do good for our fellow man and people around us so they can see Christ in us. We pray that you do that. I pray that you bless. Help us, Lord, the rest of this week. I pray that you'd help us all to tune in for Sunday school on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you folks. Hope you all have a good rest of the week. Hope to see you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Take care.